Hello and welcome. This is Faisal Mojhasen. Uh, I took introduction to CFD using MATLAB and open source code. As part of my final project, I solved three D Poisson equation using Stone's method. Uh, Poisson equation is nothing but a Laplace equation, but with an additional big source term. As far as my presentation outline is concerned, at first we'll have a basic introduction. Later on, I have my problem statement on which geometry and what uh, equation I'm solving, and a little bit of literature review and a numerical formulation and algorithm and how the black box and the stone method work. And then later on the result and discussion and conclusions at the end. And finally, I will have a question and answer session. I will give an ample of question, uh, we'll have an ample of question and answer session at the end. Okay, please note down the slide number wherever you don't understand. Okay, as far as introduction is concerned, at first, why do we need to solve engineering problems? Not, uh, we are aware not all the problems have the exact solution, so we need approximate solution. And what sort of methods are available to solve, solve the PDE? And one of these methods is stone recycling. As far as introduction is concerned, we come across many solving techniques to solve engineering problems. And many problems don't have exact solution. So as an engineer, we are satisfied with the approximate solution too. PDEs can be solved by a variety of techniques, and once we convert the PDEs into algebraic form, we need solvers. And as far as solvers are concerned, there are a variety of solvers. One of them are, a uh, few of them are direct, and other are the indirect or iterative solvers. Among the direct solvers, we came across the Gauss elimination or the matrix inversion or the framework method, which we might have learned in the high school. And as far as the iterative solvers are concerned, we have learned it in the course, the Gauss leader and successor realization method. And the other things which we have not discussed in the course are the Stone's method and the gradient method. And these, uh, the gradient method is most useful in the commercially available software like Fluent and the Convert CSV. Okay. So let's move towards the problem statement. Uh, this is the geometry of my problem. Uh, we have taken a rectangular bar uh, to which uh, there is an internal resource of generation. And here you get the equation what I'm trying to solve. This is a Poisson equation with an internal source of generation. Okay, now let me tell what my actual problem statement was. This was the equation which we have taken from the previous slide. And this is the equation which we have to design. It is a second order accuracy and centrally uh, uh, scheme. Okay, when you make PIDK as a subject of the formula, you get the following equation as shown below. Just a moment, I'll uh, put the pointer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the third equation. We, are, we have made the CIJK as the subject of the formula. Now, we come across this word SIP too many times. SIP stands for strongly implicit preconditioner. I let you know the difference between the solver and the preconditioner. Okay, for the solver, uh, we just tell this is our geometry and these are, the, are our initial and the boundary conditions and it's solved using the iterative method, what we have used like the word is or the Jacobi H2 method or the SOR method. But where are preconditioner is concerned, <clears throat> why, do, why do we call it as a preconditioner? I'll give a quick explanation for that over here. Uh, where the preconditioner is concerned, we massage the matrix before we ask the solver to solve. And how do we do the massaging? For say, we massage the hair, right? Before shampooing. For say, with oil. Obviously, for the healthy hair, right? So, and what do we do with the preconditioner? Here we ask, uh, we precondition, we massage the coefficient matrix so that our convergence rate is faster in comparison to the other method. Okay, how we are applying this preconditioner, we'll discuss it in the next slide. Okay, now my motto for today's presentation is to take, to make each of you understand Stone's method very well. Keeping in view the intricacies of the 3D case, though I have done for the 3D case, I came up with a 2D case, so once you understand the 2D case, it will be very easy to implement the 3D case. Now you have stone method, for how the stone method works for a 2D case. So I have reduced my equation to the 2D form. Again, I have digitized it in the center by using the central distance scheme with second order infinity. And here is our equation. Now we are uh, writing this equation in a comfortable form, as it's mentioned in many of the papers the same way. So I have written the form equation as it is. So look, EK, FK, DK minus one, and DK and HK are the coefficients of those variables. Whereas here we, uh, we have done it for the IJ plane, here we are doing it for the K and extension. Okay? Do not get confused with these uh, annotations. They're very easy to understand. Once again, I reiterate, 
EPA, SPA, and all these things are the coefficient, and T suffixes are the variable matrices. Okay, I'll show you the linear representation. Uh, here, ATQ is, uh, is what we call representing the matrix form. Here, uh, this is the equation what we are representing in the matrix. Look, we have got the five banded matrix. Look, for a 2D case, we got a five banded matrix. Needless to say, what a banded matrix is, I assume you have learned it in basic engineering math of 101 level course. We are going to use this idea of five, band, uh, five banded matrix in our next slide as well. So I urge you to remember this that we are coefficient matrix in the five banded matrix. And this is our solution matrix, and the Q is our initial and the boundary condition. Okay, now I am going to represent the residual and corruption form. This is the A here. A is what is, uh, is A. A is the coefficient matrix. A is again the solution. Q is the initial and boundary condition. Uh, so, this sort of equation we come across the theory uh, before we discuss any equation solver. I think even Mr. Sarang has explained it during before uh, we step into the Gaussian equation. So, no problem. I'm going to explain it to you again. Uh, we check the residual before we, we put the gate values of T uh, before we proceed to the solution and we find the residual. And once the residual is not within our limit, we go for the next equation, right? Here, delta n is the chain of C, uh, the solution matrix, real to the solution, the real to the uh, previous equation. And, and A delta n, R n is the correction form. You will get it by substituting this uh, A T in this form in the residual equation, and you will get the correction form. Okay? Okay. Now I'll go with the hypothesis of what we are doing in the stone method. As you might be aware, Gauss-Seidel and SOR take n square floating point operation in each iteration. So Stone came up with a new idea to reduce the number of floating point operations. So he started with factorizing the coefficient matrix. And how did he factorize? Let's look into this slide. Here A delta and Rn is was the corruption form of the equation what we have taken. And here the, for the coefficient mat matrix, he has factorized into the lower diagonal and upper uh, lower triangle and the upper triangle matrix. So right, this factorization thing we are substituted in the first equation, which is can be seen in the third equation here as well. Okay. Now, once we got this, the L, the why do we factorize into the lower and upper triangular matrix E? Because they are very easy to solve. Just by di direct backward and forward substitution, we get the solution matrix. So that's the main idea behind factorizing into lower and upper triangular matrix. So now you, you see, once you get the lower triangular and upper triangular matrix, you can assume u delta n is yn per, per case. Then L y n and R n is our solution, so the equation to be solved. Once you know a residual and the lower diagonal matrix, your y n can be solved just by forward substitution by n number of operations, n number of floating point operations. Once you know y n, you can find delta n. And this delta n can be added to the previous value of c n so that we get the value of c n plus 1. So this is very easy, just by n operations in backward substitution and n operations in forward substitution. So we are just having two n number of floating point operations in the stored method. Whereas you can see uh, in the gauss seidel and the, uh, the SOR method, we have n square floating point operations in each iteration. So we are reducing the floating point operations by n minus two. Now let's go into the next slide. Yeah, now the main problem is that uh, whether A is factorable or not. So here we, the stones hit the roadblock. So first, uh, what the roadblock is called, we'll discuss it later on. Firstly, how, what, uh, how we are factorizing the lower and upper diagonal matrix. Here you can see the lower triangular matrix and the upper triangular matrix which has been factorized. But if A is factorable, what we have to get, when we multiply uh, lower and upper diagonal matrix, uh, triangular matrix, we, have, we need to get back to A. But that's not the case. You can see it in this slide. When the product of LU is multiplied, you get a seven banded matrix. I think I asked you to remember in the previous slide that we have five banded matrix. Our coefficient matrix was five banded. Now we are getting a seven banded matrix. If there will exist any matrix like lower and when the product of the lower and upper diagonal uh, triangular matrix is a five banded matrix, you would have directly get away the solution in two and number of floating point operations. Not even you don't need to go even for the equation. You would get the direct exact solution. But that's not the case. So, but the coefficient matrix, which is of our interest, was only five banded matrix. We have a five banded matrix, but we are getting seven banded matrix. So, this is like we are going to solve some other problem. Here, the stones with the roadblock to get the exact solution. 
So if this system works somehow, at least to get back to our interested five banded matrix, we'll get the approximate solution. So now he went after looking into extra bands and to weed out this extra band to get the solution. How we went after then? Let's look into the next slide. Okay. These are the terms which we obtained from the previous slide. Huh? Do not get confused with it. Okay. Okay. This was uh, the first one was our solution. Uh, the actual equation, uh, what we obtained from the actual stresses. You can see the second equation when which is obtained from the product of LU. So the three terms, the CK and GK terms, which are marked in red, are the additional terms which we are not in need. So let's look for the stresses where these actual points are positioned. One point G is positioned towards the northwest, the other point C is positioned towards the northeast. And the distance, uh, as we are dealing with the KN scale, let's not uh, confuse, it's the same as IJ scale. Now K is, uh, we move towards the positive end, it's K plus one, and towards positive Y, it's K plus N. And towards negative Y, it's K minus N, the same one. Let's see how we are reaching K plus N minus one. We are moving towards north, K plus N, and moving towards left, K plus N minus one. Okay, the distance between two grid points along the X axis is delta X, and the distance between two grid points along the Y axis is delta Y. Okay, so these two red terms are extra terms. Now, uh, the stone made, uh, made an attempt to read out this term or to make it insignificant. Somehow you cannot uh, completely read out those terms because <coughs> you cannot get an exact solution just in LGP. So there's no other way to get the exact solution. As in for, for simple problem, there is an exact solution, but for the complex problem, you cannot get an exact solution. <coughs> so how did he try to read out these two terms? So he tried to write TK minus N plus one or TK plus N minus one in terms of the known terms. What are known terms? The four terms what I have shown you, K plus N, K minus N, <coughs> and K plus one and K minus one. <coughs> Sorry. Now look, now we are writing this K plus N minus one term in the form of 2D, uh, what we call this Taylor, 2D Taylor series form. So once you write this and you write the first order, I mean first uh, differentiation term in this form, is first order approximation, you can substitute, when you substitute this term, you'll get this equation. And you can say that you put these equations in the unknown and you get more of the solution. Now let's see, as we got these two equations from the previous slide, we are putting it, but we are multiplying with this alpha. Alpha is nothing but the relaxation parameter, what uh, one of the like, what you have seen in so R, or successive over relaxation scheme. It's uh, where successive over relaxation was uh, over relaxation, but here it's under relaxation where the value would be less than one. Okay. <coughs> and uh, the thing is that as there's a proof in the paper for that, uh, uh, how the terms of CK and CK will diminish as the iteration proceeds. Okay. But now let's now, as of now, trust me and leave it to the wisdom of mathematicians. <coughs> As far as proceeding with further calculation, uh, step one is concerned, <coughs> we derive all the Rodin equations and determine dk, 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 and dk. These are nothing but the coefficients. Okay? And uh, as we have the seven banded matrix as the product of LU, we need to find this uh, small dk and all other things. Once you get these elements, you will uh, you'll form the L matrix, and once you uh, get E and L, you form Q matrix. And, uh, and you'll get the guess values of RO and go by forward and backward substitution. And you update the value of Pn plus 1 in every equation. And then once you get update the value of this equation, just a moment. Hello. Hello, are you here? Yes, yes, yes. Are you, yes, are yes. You we, can, we can hear you, Yeah. Okay. Okay, the, the last step is repeat three to six steps until converges. Uh, okay, now let I uh, have performed the mesh dependency study. So I have done it for different grid size for my geometry. I have done it for the 3D case, do it for the 2D case, what I have explained to you. So for the 2D case, I've got the average value of this and the percentage difference there is for the stagnation after some uh, after such a size of grid. So I have gone with I have moved this 25 by 25 by 25 this size. So as far as validation with the analytical solution is concerned, the solution for uh, one of these uh, problems with the uh, sinusoidal heat flux on one side of the rectangular bar is provided in the inductive mathematical method for engineering textbook. 
and I solved this analytical solution and solved my problem. And I presenting the solution at one of the planes because you cannot, I, I don't know how to do the volume rendering in MATLAB. So I have done it just, I'm showing it for one of the planes over here. And that is equal to 0 0.4. And you can see there is not much difference. We'll discuss about this difference in the later slide. As far as uh, the other cases, what we have done, I have compared with using Fluent. So here all the walls, uh, I've done it for many cases, but keeping in view the time constraint, I'm showing up the results with, for only one case in my presentation. You can look uh, after the, some other cases in my, what we call, I will update the project in the project site, so you can have the results for all the cases so, along with the code, hopefully. So as far as uh, yeah, the boundary conditions were concerned, all walls were adiabatic here, and other wall was, was at 400 Kelvin, one wall. So you can see the pattern was same, and I got this solution. And let's move to the other solution. These are the other solutions what I have got from two But I have got the actual, uh, what we call the SIB solution, and I have it in my paper, which I'll upload it, uh, maybe in a year or two. Okay, I have done it for the various heat sources. Here I made an effort to include the nonlinear heat source. The constant source, okay, we can do it. The linear and quadratic source, once we include that, the problem becomes very tough. As far as comparison with the fluid is concerned, I made a comparison at one particular plane. Uh, I have got the results using fluid, I have got the results using MATLAB, and I have found the difference. Now you can see the difference, the maximum difference was the, the fluent and MATLAB was hardly 0 0.03 Kelvin. So, and we look at the, some other uh, best things that have, uh, that are with, <coughs> that, are, that do work with the SIP. Let's see. I have tried to solve one of the problems with God's serial method and SOR technique and stone the SIP. So now see at the 1E4 minus 7 uh, accuracy, the number of filtrations taken by uh, God's serial is somewhere around 1300. Whereas for the SOR it is uh, less than 100 and for the stone the SIP it is less than 50. Now you can ask me, Look, SOR is good enough as it takes less number of filtrations and less space. And in terms of optimization, SOR seems best. But for SOR, we need to find under relaxation parameters. There is no known equation for such complex problem to determine the relaxation parameter. Whereas in the code, we have got one equation to find the relaxation parameter. But uh, unlike the complex problem, you don't get a state of uh, you don't get a state of equation. You just need to give a trial and error. But I've written a code to find the, what you call the minimum number of filtration does the SOR take for the optimum, to find the optimum value of omega. So I wrote the code, so that's the reason why it's showing you, showing us less number of, uh, it's, it's taking less number of filtration. So that's the reason why we are not taking the computation effort taken in determining the, what we call the relaxation parameter in SOR. So it is not actually the good scale to compare SOR with the uh, stored SIP over here. Okay, and look at SIP is directly taking less number of iteration and you're directly straight away getting the solution. Okay, now let's look at the other solution what I have. Uh, now let, I, don't, I did not post many to new results over here. So let's take the conclusion. I developed a 3D numerical code for strongly SIP was developed for a rectangular bar using finite decentralization. And my values with the fluid were varying at 0 0.03 Kelvin. And whereas the analytical solution, it was found to be 0 0.15 Kelvin. I have tried it for various uh, boundary conditions, uh, that may be adiabatic or convective, radiative and constant temperature boundary conditions were implemented on the various sides of the rectangular bar. But uh, I did not discuss that by I think uh, one of the disadvantages with uh, Stone's method is that it takes too much of memory allocation, right? Uh, so because uh, whereas in the uh, Gossidal, it takes only n, it takes n by n space over here. As we do not have constraint of memory these days, so I think SIP is much better than Gossidal and what we call uh, SOR. Okay, now we'll open the floor for the questions.